All right, we are going to, um, I want to set the stage a little bit for Mr. Uh, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Paul Flynn. He is, uh, he is our man on the scene in England. He is a parliamentarian in the Labor Party. We'll get him to tell us about exactly what that means and what he does and what kind of influence he has once we bring him on. He is uh, an extremely, uh, what we would call an elder. I would call him an elder. He's a very wise man. And if you've listened to more than one or two of these episodes of Green Crush, you will have heard, as you did in the intro here, uh, Paul saying, to break the law. And we're going to hear why that is. From Paul. So let's... uh, let's, uh, I'm excited about this because uh, I, I've this guy's been in every show. Kim pointed out, <laughs> she said it was in. He's been in almost every single show. Paul, yeah, well, not like he's gonna be today. So this is very exciting. Here we go. We're gonna call Paul. Here we go. Ringy dingy. Come on, Paul. Oh, hello. Paul. How are you? I am fine. You're asking me. I was going to ask you, how are you, sir? What a day you've had. It's been a great day. It's uh, it's marvelous to see the good citizens of Britain challenging uh, an oppressive law. Now, can you, uh, can you, before we get to that oppressive law, let, let's, let's, uh, I want to introduce you to the reason we started following you, sir, quite a while ago is because you've already, you've already been standing in Parliament telling them like it is and like it should be known. And um, we, we had great admiration and respect for you. And we started to use audio clips of you in the show because, you know, you're saying what we're saying here. This, you know, this is, this is, uh, this seems to be basic logic that you're you're shining a light on. So, how did you how did you find out that uh, you know you needed to be a politician in in the Labour Party? Like, let's tell everybody in the world who is listening because we have a lot of people around the world. Let's introduce you properly. You are a sitting member of the Labour Party in Britain. Tell us a little bit about what that means and what your responsibilities are, and then we'll, then we'll get to what your position on, on cannabis is. I, I'm, uh, I've been around for a long time. I'm the oldest uh, frontbencher since Gladstone in Britain. Uh, I'm 82. Uh, I've just been re-elected for another five years, which shows a great deal of uh, optimism uh, from the constituents. But I've never lied uh, to my constituents, and I've always followed the paths of what I regard to be uh, scientific logic. And I'm afraid I've I've written a book about uh, MPs, which is was the best book on the subject and the only book on the subject called How to Be an MP, which nearly all new MPs read. And I've got very powerful vo- views, I believe, on. Uh, on how politics fails and how democratic politics fails. I'm afraid we tend to be in the middle of a crisis, uh, babies cry, dogs bark, politicians legislate. And we just passed a, a piece of legislation here a year ago on, uh, on psychoactive drugs that did positive harm. It actually increased the number of people who use those drugs and who, uh, who die as a result of them. So I think we, we have to follow lines uh, that are scientific. But I'm afraid most political decisions are prejudice-rich and, and uh, uh, information-light. Uh, well, what was the policy they had where they died? What, what was that policy? What do you mean by that? Well, this was on psychoactive drugs. And, uh, you know, these are terrible things. And anyone would be very foolish to take them because they're drugs that have never been ingested by human beings before. So we don't know what the consequences could be on them. Oh, right. The government were flapping around and decided that there is a legal market that existed last year. They closed that down. That's simple to do. Police matter. But they should have studied what happened in the two countries 
which was Poland and Ireland, that produced similar laws. And the result was in each case, the number of drugs increased and the number of deaths increased. And we've had exactly the same here. But uh, 47 years ago in Britain, we passed a law to bring in the most uh, stringent uh, punishments for the use of certain drugs. At the time, there were fewer than a thousand users of cocaine and heroin in Britain. Virtually no users of, uh, of cannabis except medicinal cannabis. And since then, we don't have a thousand now. We have... Uh, a grand total of 380,000. And if you contrast that with Holland, Holland, after 50 years of uh, in, intelligent, pragmatic drug laws, have a serious prison problem in that they don't have enough prisoners to fill their jails. And they're using some of them for role play. I mean, what do you do with a redundant prison? And we in this country, in Britain, have got a record prison population with terrible abuse uh, going on in them. And uh, we're still packing the prison out with people uh, who've uh, committed no greater offense than seeking relief from their pain. And that was what it was all about today. Yeah. And I believe it comes to a point where it's the duty of the good citizen to challenge a law that oppresses uh, the sick and, and the weak. And that's what this law does. And those people suffering, as many of them, a couple of hundred turned up today, who are suffering from multiple sclerosis, can mm -hmm. find only a relief, the only relief they can find is from using cannabis, and the government deny them that and say you could be thrown into the uh, prison for five years. But what was proved today is that the law is an ass. Nobody implemented that law in public, the police were warned they were going to be there and they were breaking the law and there were no arrests and the police were happy to see it go. Well, that if the law is unenforceable, it ought to be swept away. Absolutely. I mean, it's it, this is the thing that spawned the show. I mean, this is why we talk to people like you and try to get this word out that whatever the law is, it, it can't be sacrosanct just as the law itself, not if it's so demonstrably harmful. So that's that's how we came across you, sir, watching some of your things in YouTube. Were you uh, when was that when you counseled that uh, people should come to the steps of Parliament and partake it, it, in some way? It, it was an act of desperation, really, because I've been I've, I've had bills 20 years ago, 25 years ago on this. And the government has not changed one iota in their policies that still pulling out the same old nonsense that prohibition works and you've got to crack down on drug users. When the evidence from your country, uh, from 29 states in America, from, Pol from uh, uh, Portugal and other countries in, in Europe, is that uh, prohibition doesn't work, but sensible, uh, rational policies reduce drug harm and drug use and you know the, the, there is no evidence to the contrary and what we're up against is the cowardice of politicians who refuse to lead it's what their job is our job is not to follow uh, public opinion particularly the lowest denomination of public opinion that's expressed in some of the popular newspapers we've got to say look this doesn't work we've been doing it for 46 years it's made the situation far worse and we've, we've got to take uh, the drug distribution manufacture out of the hands of uh, gangsters, of scammers, of crooks, and replace it with a market that can be uh, controlled and which can be responsible. And in that way, we will reduce all drug harm. So where, where are you uh, on that today? I mean, that was that speech uh, back, back a little while ago when we first came across you back in June of this year. And then you just had a speech today. Right? Yes. I, uh, I mean, I continue to, uh, we, we, well, they, nobody opposed it today, uh, we, which means that it goes through uh, uh, its first reading and we'll go through the parliamentary system now. But it means, I believe, the only way of getting a public to change. And we know that the polls that are conducted, there was one after the last time when I incited people to come up here and break the law. And there was 82 percent supported my point of view. And there have been polls of MPs. But MPs tend to say one thing in private 
uh, but put on a bit of a show for oh, their... I'm sure they do. <laughs> I'm afraid it, it does happen in this, uh, in, the, in this wicked world. Oh, I'm sure it um, does. If they, but the politics is above that, you know. We've got oh. <laughs> so we've got the power uh, to change this. I mean, when you see um, the people who are suffering the the torments of multiple sclerosis, you know, somebody gave a very mm. impassioned uh, plea today of what it meant to him. It gave him dignity in his life uh, that he could use cannabis. It meant so he could lead a normal life. He wasn't tormented uh, by the pain of multiple sclerosis or the effects of the spasm yeah and i know was, everybody i know that that has that use that uses cannabis says like they can't get enough of it like it's the best thing yeah. going yeah and i think we've got to you know we take i i, I don't want anyone to smoke this stuff uh, or to mix it with tobacco but uh because under prohibition that's the easiest way to do it but i want to encourage people to as happened today people were using it in cakes in uh, drinks in vaping it, using it as an ointment, but do you then avoid the uh, the dangers that there are in smoking anything? In smoking, uh, if you smoke uh, banana peel, you uh, there, there's a danger. But smoking itself is a dangerous uh, occupation. I don't, and and the drug itself, I mean, the is, is very addictive. Yeah. So I, I certainly don't want to get people to into that. But it, it, with a legal market uh, which would be run by. Uh, doctors and responsible people, we can get people off the most dangerous forms of the drug and get them to use it for its uh, benefit, which has been used by all civilizations for 5,000 years, for goodness sake. Yeah. I, I wanted to know, as, as a, you know, a member of parliament and uh, representative of your, uh, your area, and you have to deal with <laughs> whatever's going on in government, and bring that to your neighborhood, basically. Um, well, there, there's there's a question I have: is you know in the um, in the food pyramid, if the government is so kind to offer us a, a structure of what we should be eating, we should be eating so many meats and so many grains and so many greens. The the reason that they say things like kale and and beet greens and lettuce and, and endive and, and Brussels sprouts and those things are healthy and, and you should eat them is because they've been analyzed to a point where we realize, yeah, that's a good idea to eat that stuff. So, so where is the testing? I mean, if we got to the testing on showing just exactly how healthful this thing is, even in the male plant form, um, even in its own, without even the, the THC aspect. And mm. to be able to just take it at any time without having like laws against being able to do that and using it as a food source. Indeed. Um, I think the, uh, I mean, our, our laws that we have uh, on, uh, and the advice we give on uh, food, which has been improved enormously uh, in this country. But we, we, we the situation is that... Um, uh, that juries have got together when they've been uh, faced with defendants who are accused of using cannabis uh, and can prove to the jury that in wheelchairs, they're elderly, they cry. And what a jury said to the judge, look, we're not going to convict this man. We disagree with this law. Can we let him off? And the judge said, no, it's not my job as a judge or you, mm -hmm. your job as a jury uh, to decide what the law is. It's Parliament's job. And Parliament uh, runs away and uh, people hide their heads yeah. under a pillow to avoid taking uh, a decision uh, that, that they might see as embarrassing. But it's not true. I mean, I've been uh, giving this message out for, uh, for uh, more than 30 years now. I was first elected uh, in a constituency where there was a Conservative MP and I stood as a Labour MP and I've been re-elected for eight times. So it's, it's, there's no sign that uh, people uh, respect you for, if you stick with it by your guns, if you tell them how it is, never lie to them, and, and follow out what you believe. Yeah, when I first started to hear about you, sir, uh, this would have been back in the early uh, aughts, and because I was paying attention to what was going on 
in the in the war with the the Gulf War with George Bush and Iraq yeah. and because of 9/11 we're going into Iraq and all of that nonsense. And there's a lot of you on YouTube talking about that and um, saying things that your colleagues seem to find quite offensive, but in retrospect are pretty much exactly how things unfolded. I mean, it's an immense tragedy. The uh, the Iraq war, as far as Britain was concerned, we went in because of the vanity of one man. Even worse was when we went into Helmand province. I mean, it was probably right to go into Afghanistan, but not to go into Helmand. And we it, again, there was a an idea that we could go into Helmand and close down the drug trade, would you believe? And in the hope that not a shot would be fired. And we lost 450 British soldiers there. And I got thrown out of the, the Commons for saying that telling young men and women that if they went to Helmand, they could stop bombs exploding, terrorism on the streets of Britain. It was, abs it was an utter lie in that the... Uh, uh, there was no uh, danger of the Taliban uh, using acts of terrorism. Britain, other groups might have done it, and the the result of that is that um, we threw those lives away. And I believe I just we had a debate uh, uh, about the hundred years anniversary of Passchendaele. My father was at Passchendaele, and he went there because he was told that he could stop the wicked Huns from bayoneting Belgium babies. And he came back from that war. He went there hating Germans. He came back loving Germans because they saved his life. They picked him up when he was bleeding to death in no man's land and uh, gave him good treatment. And But the idea that we can, a hundred years after Passchendaele, we're still talking the same nonsense and still throwing away lives in the belief Whoa. that it's okay for politicians to lie and soldiers to die. So you don't seem like a regular, you don't seem like you're not, you're not a regular politician because when, when um, you say things exactly like that, all I can think of is most of us don't want to do these things. And yet we are shepherded into those decisions by these policy makers who are, who are the minority, really. And we, we, we seem to get nailed every single turn. I, I, my belief is that, uh, you know, you stick to uh, uh, those decisions. I, I've been called controversial. I found out this means <laughs> that everyone intelligent agrees with every word I say <laughs> about 25 years after I say it. So I have to stick here and I have to keep going uh, in order to be proved right in the end. But I'm I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever said or, or written in politics. And I'm, I've got a little niche where, uh, you know, my books are well read and uh, people do take some notice. I've got some idea yeah. that they will dawn this glorious day uh, when the world comes to its senses. But I'm deeply depressed by the exchange of... Uh, of the president in the United States uh, for what appears to be a petulant child without a brain, yeah. uh, denying every intelligent uh, policy that is introduced by the, the greatest pol politician of my uh, life, uh, Obama. Oh, did you meet him? I did meet him, yes, uh, very briefly. My wife met him. He's very, he was, my wife was... Uh, I introduced, after 10 minutes acquaintance with him, I introduced him to my wife and he looked at her and he looked at me and he looked at her and then looked at me and he said, you're a very lucky man. <laughs> well, Something my wife will never forget. He might well have said it to a hundred people, but uh, she will never forget that. Yeah, I guess she, she took that well. That's pretty cool. Oh. Yeah. So when, when you, uh, if I may ask, as, as a person recommending, um, the use of of this uh, substance how do you answer the uh, very often made criticism that uh, and and rightly so it should be discussed what do you say when when people ask you or or they protest and say if we if we do this if we legalize it in this way uh, it's going to be bad for the kids bad for yeah. the children 
I mean, it, it's a powerful drug, and we shouldn't uh, underestimate the dangers of any drug. But the head of uh, no, a scientist who is a head of the uh, of the advisory body on drugs in England said that you would have to. Uh, to stop uh, 5,000 people uh, using cannabis to stop one case of psychosis. But there's certainly a link uh, between uh, mental illness and uh, heavy cannabis use. But it's a very slight one. And uh, with a legal market, you've got a better chance of keeping uh, drugs out of the hands of people who are mentally fragile or, or who are young. Uh, I mean, our laws state in this country that you could give a cannabis to a, uh, sell cannabis to a, a mentally disturbed 12-year-old, and it's the same expense as selling it to a well-balanced uh, adult. So the, we, we must respect that. But, uh, and if I mention the, the, the three drugs that I'm campaigning against at the moment, are the three dangers, are opioid use, mm. uh, a drug called valparate, which is causing birth defects among uh, women, and uh, the overuse of neuroleptic drugs in residential homes for the elderly, where it's used like it's it's used to keep them quiet and to cut the cost of running the home. But that's drug misuse on a vast scale, and the opioids in America have got to a stage where more people are dying from opioids than die from guns and traffic accidents. And it's coming over here with a huge increase in the prescription of opioids for things like uh, uh, depression and uh, mild pain. And this is, is leading to people into uh, lifelong dependency and to early deaths. But the, these are the, the serious drugs. Cannabis has been around for so long. We didn't know about any uh, major side effects they'd have. We made too much fuss about it. And we've left people with the choice of using it uh, mixed with tobacco uh, where instead of encouraging them to use it in safer ways. Yeah. Well, yeah, it shouldn't. I don't uh, I don't tell people what they should do, but uh, I don't I don't really recommend smoking it. No, there's so many better ways to uh, to take sure. it in. Hey, just going back a little bit on your um, on your political history, uh, as we as we go through your Wikipedia page uh, to catch up on who is this uh, multi-decade performer in the uh, parliament, um, and, and we look through everything. What what do you what do you think about when? <laughs> is there any kind of political capital at all? When you seem to say these outrageous things, such as uh, what was going on in the Gulf War back in '03, and your opposition was, uh, you know, shouting you down to be completely out of line and ridiculous, and of course, in retrospect, you've nailed it. So when you keep doing that, and it seems like you have done that a lot, and I'm going to say that it's that kind of uh, political acumen that I've seen in you that I agree with, particularly on this issue of cannabis. So I, I just wonder, like, how, how, how astute do you think I think you are because of your history of being on so many of these things? Do you ever get any kind of uh, people behind you, sort of saying, "Okay, I all right, I agree. You you got us like on these six major points. I'll back you up on this one." Yeah, I mean, it was. 25 years ago, I had a bill in the House of Commons to ban blows to the head in boxing. And it was regarded as crazy, you know, you, but you could organize boxing to stop the head being the target. Right. Now I know that in football and in so many other sports, in rugby, I mean, horrendous damage is done by using the head as a, as a target. A concussion as a, the effect of bringing on early Alzheimer's. Now. Scientists proved that uh, 25 years ago, but people are so set in their ways. I mean, I, I boxed as a child and, uh, you know, like the sport very much, but I get to the stage now where I just sort of try to guess how many million brain cells are being destroyed, permanently destroyed uh, by blows to the head. And we can organize a, a sport where there are fewer uh, activities where, they, where, where the, their head is involved uh, as, as a weapon or as a target. And uh, still the, the sports that would test the athleticism 
of, of those taking part. Now, uh, as so I when say, you when you were boxing, are you telling me when when you were boxing, you you weren't punching your opponent in the head no, ever? I was. Oh God, yes. No, no. I did all the. Uh, I, I I was before I was enlightened. This was a long, long time ago. <laughs> Uh, it's when the evidence come up and you see the the postmortems conducted on boxers and something like three quarters of them show brain damage uh, that uh, wasn't obvious. And then so many, we used to call it, uh, we used to make a joke of it. There was always someone who was punch drunk who was ambling around the gym. Right. Uh, quite right. And uh, we didn't realize in our cruel way that this was uh, brain damage. This was early Alzheimer's. Uh, this was someone's brain. Uh, it turned to mush by the uh, yeah. repeated dose. And it's got a cumulative effect, and the brain cells don't regenerate. But no, the, but I mean, speaking of that, though, you know about the medical uh, advances of CTE, that brain-wasting disease that you're talking about. And uh, there's a lot of good research about cannabis uh, uh, with that as well. Indeed. I wish, but I think one of the effects of this bill, if it becomes law, it would be to free up uh, the research. At the moment, there's huge bureaucratic hurdles to doing research into cannabis. It's a hugely complex uh, object. There are 92 cannabinoids in there. There are lots of other uh, substances there. And we really don't know wh which cannabinoids uh, work, what effect they have. So I'm all for uh, freeing up the research that we have uh, so we can use this uh, natural uh, object uh, for the benefit of humankind so b basically we're down to uh, uh, to try to get it down to a bumper sticker on a car uh, um you'd have to say that uh you know how would you do that i mean would you say you know we need to educate people or or because every time i hear the word education particularly when it's coming out from the government surrounding a cannabis policy i mean we but know we, it's going to be <laughs> That's not where we need to go. I mean, things uh, are going so well now in the last uh, five or ten years. Uh, I mean, your country, uh, Trudeau, is, is very good news. And so are the, uh, the states in America. And we're seeing the, the other states the, uh, in, in South America, who the cu countries that have been ravaged by the drugs trade. Uh, the, uh, the, the drugs are enjoyed in, uh, in Chicago. But the people who are being shot are in Mexico and people suffering from the, the drug wars there. But I believe the, the, uh, the, the advances within Europe, I quoted uh, Portugal and Holland, but other countries now are saying, look, for goodness sake, we, what, these policies are not working. They're doing harm. And I believe that uh, they, they, there's never been a time for more optimism than there is now. What do you foresee in uh, in a world where, I should say, uh, not trying to do the movie trailer guy, but in a world where we actually do, say we, meaning Britain, uh, South Africa is in now, a lot of places in Europe, if we do actually decriminalize and stop putting people in jail. I know people are legalizing it, but that's not the same thing as decriminalizing it. I mean, where do yeah. you think we are going to be if we do actually go down that road after, say, a decade? Are we going to all come out like Portugal? I mean, is this all going to be like a global Portugal experiment? What do you think about that kind of stuff? Well, well, Portugal, within a year of after 2001, after they uh, depenalized their drugs, they cut their deaths uh, by half, and it's continued on that. They've cu obviously cut their uh, the amount spent in the criminal justice system and and in prisons, and it's gone on. And the the policy has sold itself to the population, and people find it uh, a popular cause now. But I, I'm, I'm encouraged by America, who are not the, uh, the most advanced on drugs. I mean, they gave us prohibition in the 20s and uh, 30s, an utter disaster, where the drugs that were being sold were by the most irresponsible people. And they were the worst, most dangerous form of drugs, of alcohol, because it was distilled spirit that was poisoning people. So we, you know, we must learn these lessons. And I believe that... Uh, you know, there was a time uh, about, uh, I went to Russia about 15 years ago, 
where they didn't have uh, drugs problems or the extent they had alcohol problems and they decided that uh, as we had these drug problems we were the people to uh, to show them how to uh, cure it and unfortunately too many of the prohibitionists went there and sent them down the wrong path but i believe there is a movement or throughout europe now uh, which is um, you know, being given a wonderful boost uh, by Trudeau in order to uh, have policies that reduce harm and don't multiply it. All right. Well, listen, as a, as a British parliamentarian, uh, let me ask you this. We have heard uh, rumblings that uh, the UK is preparing for war with North Korea. Do you have any input on that? Have you heard anything to that effect? Um, it would be an act of unspeakable stupidity if, if that's the case. Oh, but you can't rule it out just based on that, based on history. No, they, they, we've done some very stupid things in history. But I believe that uh, our link uh, with uh, Trump is, is a damaging one. We ought to treat him uh, as the... Uh, as a man of protozoan intelligence who behaves uh, like a, a petulant child in any situation. He's constantly uh, praising himself in terms that only uh, uh, an immature child would. He treats every crisis as an opportunity to praise the himself. And didn't we do well? Didn't we send in good rescue equipment? It's secondary that people died or are living in, in misery. But here we have a man who squared up to uh, the irrational leader of North Korea, and we've had a series of these. And if we're going to have a nuclear war, it'll come from almost certainly by accident, uh, by a, uh, a technical uh, fault, or, or, or just by uh, a mistake. And the, the nearer we get to having these... Uh, uh, light trigger confrontations and a threatening nuclear war, the danger is that something will go badly wrong. There'll be a wrong signal sent out. There'll be somebody will uh, will, will, will see a, a, a missile being launched that's, uh, that's not going anywhere in a dangerous way or that's not armed and, and uh, fire back. But we're, we're in a, the most dangerous situation that we've been in, certainly since the, uh, the Cuba crisis, uh, when uh, the the two uh, halves of the world squared up against each other. Yeah, but and while we, we're hanging in the balance of of uh, we're hanging in the balance of trying to understand if there's going to be a war there or not, and and if so, why are they telling us that you know at the other end of the suit they say that you know this stuff this cannabis stuff is harmful we don't want it to, we don't want it to harm people. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, they're engaging in r saber rattling at, uh, with a, an alleged madman with nuclear weapons. For what reason? You know. No, no, no I mean we every crisis uh, that uh, Trump has addressed, he's managed to dangerously inflame. These are frozen crises that have been around for a long time, but uh, but are not active. He's even inflamed a fossilized crisis in the American Civil War, for goodness sake. He's got people mm -hmm. divided between the two sides there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the man is an utter menace. And uh, I mean, I'm hoping that uh, the wise heads in America will do what they did with Nixon towards the end of his uh, presidency, where they disabled his nuclear trigger. Uh, he was starting to drink too much, and he was making threats about, I can go into the next room and kill a million people. And yeah. this alarmed the people around him. But I'm hoping that uh, the bag that uh, has been carried around for, for Trump's uh, nuclear trigger is, is disabled. And if he does start to play with it, it doesn't work, because I think it'd be justified uh, by the few cool heads that are in his government. They're not all uh, as mad as he is. Well, it takes a certain breed to be a president, apparently, going by history, anyway. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and there have been some pretty strange ones, but I think we've, uh, you know, we, the, the founding fathers and mothers of America did put in some pretty good safeguards in order to guard them for a president that uh, goes out of his mind. And uh, I think we've... Uh, 
in Trump, we, those safeguards should come into play. But uh, when uh, he was referred to as an effing moron by his uh, his uh, Secretary of State, that was an encouraging sign that he had a proper judgment of <laughs> the actual abilities of uh, the president. Oh, Tillerson, the remark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. So yeah. where where would it be? Where would we be in your mind? Where would we be if we got to a place where... Uh, it is okay to have this stuff, and you know where would it be coming from? How how do you envision um, a, a transition from what this uh, repress? Because what I look at it as how how we arrest you now versus how we arrest you later regarding any of these changing legislations. Yeah. Um, I think it's going well. I've never been so optimistic. We we were in this spiral, this downward spiral of increasing prohibition. Of, of uh, uh, I mean, I've been in the, the House of Commons to show the bizarre nature of the place, so, you know, 25 years ago, where we always had a Friday debate. And I can recall one where I raised a point of order because the spokesman for the government and the spokesman for the opposition both had to leave the chamber at one point because they needed a fix. Uh, they were both uh, uh, addicted to tobacco, and they went. One of them has died since of lung cancer, oh, but they wow. were there preaching away and saying to young people, "You mustn't use cannabis." Whereas the pair of them, uh, within a few hours after the debate, uh, were in one of the sixteen bars in the House of Commons, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, with a glass of whiskey in their hands and a couple of paracetamol in their top pockets for the headache they were going to get next day, quite oblivious to the fact that their drugs of choice were far, far more dangerous yeah. than the drugs that they were stopping young people from using. Yeah, that's the irony. They're squatting outside in the alleyway in the garbage oh. bins while people are boozing it up inside, no problem. Yeah, we did We did have one nice moment when there was a... a woman uh, politician who was home secretary uh, Anne Widdicombe and she decided she was going to have a crackdown on drug use and multiply the fines and multiply the prison sentences because these were, these were terrible drugs that would put people on the slippery mm. slope how did that go? about a dozen of her own party front bench the conservative front bench uh, re rebelled against this and said we use uh, a cannabis when we were young and we haven't ended up with the dead in a gutter with a needle sticking out of us but they had ended up on the conservative front bench which is different sort of degradation but it was, <laughs> didn't kill you uh, but it was a i mean they, there are indications that uh, people of good sense and intelligence you know appreciate the utter dark wasteful futility of our drug laws yeah, what is with what? What do you understand about the uh, the general? I, I've read this so many places where uh, the war effort, let's call it that, whether you agree with it or not, the war effort of going into Afghanistan, and where at once upon a time they seem to have no opium trade, but it seems like the Allied forces of America, Canada, and, you know, Britain, and some of the others, I guess, probably uh, whoever else comes up, uh, New Zealand gets in there, who knows, one of those guys, and comes in and, and shepherds, basically, they shepherd this crop of opium. Mm. Well, we got, we got, I mean, the reading the history of uh, the relationship between Britain and China, the opium wars, where we, uh, we wickedly used... Uh, opium in order to uh, gain power there. I mean, it's a terrible uh, chapter in our history. Well, I believe that we've got into a situation. I wrote to Tony Blair in, uh, in March uh, 2003 and said, if we go into Iraq, you know, without trying to solve the problems between Palestine and Israel, um, we would seem to be acting in a one-sided way against the Muslim population which will inflame antagonism from the mosque in my constituency uh, to the far corners of the world. Uh, and we did that. I mean, the result of going into Iraq in order to shore up the uh, Bush's war there um, did lead to terrorist attacks here. 
and that deep antagonism. And it's very difficult to shift Muslim opinion from a belief uh, that uh, the, the, the Christian Western world is, is out to get them and to treat them badly. But we contributed to that uh, by, the, uh, by the Iraq war. And uh, I mean, they've had a period of virtually continuous chaos ever since, since 2003, with a great deal of, uh, of bloodshed. And the whole place is, uh, well, almost the whole place is, uh, is living in, in terrible state now. But we can't look at these things and say, well, Bush and Blair, what did they achieve? I mean, Canada came out quite early out of the war after a very honorable uh, period there in which they lost. Uh, uh, a large number of uh, lives there, of Canadian lives, but Canada did take a decision to pull out when it was clearly achieving nothing. And we're in a position now where we stayed on and the areas where most British uh, people died is now run by who? Uh, the Taliban. And the what happened to the drugs trade? It's exactly the same. 95% of the heroin in the United States, that was the player's excuse for going in. So there's a terrible thing. 95% of the heroin consumed in Britain comes from Afghanistan. I mean, it still does. Well, they make still sure it does, say. though. They make no. sure it does. Don't you think? Or uh, Yes, I mean, I, well, I mean, that's the way. I mean, we I should have phrased well, that I, in the form of a question. Long, I'm sorry. I belong to an organization that tried to get the uh, the the uh, the the poppies from uh, there was a group called the Sandley's Council, which was designed to uh, use uh, the uh, poppies uh, from Afghanistan uh, for morphine. It, it happened in uh, in Turkey, where they they changed it from uh, heroin that was being produced there into uh, morphine, very similar chemical. Uh, yeah. Uh, Products, but one, there, there was a shortage of morphine in the world. In poor countries, you can't get it. And we all might be grateful for having uh, what is the virtually identical substance to heroin in our final agonies of life be, to get a relief from pain there. So well, it, it is another medicine. And we turned it into a drug of abuse. Before we get to the final agonies of life, what what would you think would happen if if uh, cannabis was uh, you know more freely accessible and more uh, educationally promoted as to what it exactly does? Where do you think that would leave us with the opioid crisis? Well, we know what happened in Britain when we reduced it from uh, a classification B to a classification C, which is a milder form of punishment. The use, people threw up their hands and said, the use is going to increase. It didn't. It actually decreased. Yeah. One of the effects we have with uh, uh, criminalizing cannabis is we give a send out a message to young people saying this stuff is wicked. It'll, uh, it's dangerous. Your parents won't like you to use it. And there's nothing. And, and of course, all young people know that they're immortal. They're never going to die. And you give them... <laughs> irresistible recipe to take it over but if you go to holland i mean you can go out with your granny on a birthday party and have a cannabis cake as you, you know, should in that as so you I mean, should. we're actually encouraging the use of it by giving it the glamour of being illegal and i believe it would take its place among all the other drugs uh, that we have uh, people uh, don't drink whiskey in the same way as they drink beer and I believe that one day we could well have heroin beer available. We well have uh, cannabis. We, we have cannabis foods now. Yeah. And people take it at the weekend when they were relaxing, like they're having a glass of wine now, um, and uh, uh, treat it as, uh, as an adult decision to take it. And we, we, if we put out all the drugs in order of... Uh, toxicity or likely to cause addictions or poisons, we get a very different picture to the one we have, which classifies certain drugs as legal and acceptable and other drugs as dangerous and uh, unacceptable. So in, the, in, in that those uh, drugs right now, uh, let's say, are illegal in, in, the mo in the larger sense of the word in Great Britain, where does all of the cannabis in Great Britain come from? 
Uh, the On the medical side, most people are growing their own. I mean, I, I advise people to go along to Holland and get some seeds from the market in Amsterdam. And, and many of them are doing that now. But others, I know of a, a former policewoman who was forced uh, uh, to go around to become a customer of the petty criminals that she once arrested. Uh, and the, the the other problem is that there are lots of scammers about. There are people who who cheat, who uh, provide uh, cannabis of, of poor quality, or even it's not even yeah. cannabis. You see, so we we've got an illegal market, but most people are advised if they can't find a, a regular safe supply um, to grow their own, and uh, most people do it quite successfully. May I ask the big question? Yeah. Do you grow your own, sir? No, no, I've never used an illegal drug in my boring life. <laughs> You've I, never yeah. actually also no, partaken of the herb. Yeah. You knew I had to get to this. I mean. No, I've got, I've got, um, I've had arthritis since I was a child, and uh, I've, I've kept safe by, uh, by not taking the drugs and staying away from men with knives all my life. So. <laughs> any surgery That's... well i've also i've also believed that um there's a purpose in pain and if uh michelangelo had been on uh, painkillers and uh, mozart had been on ritalin we would never have heard of them they'd have gone through their life uh, with uh, beatific smiles on their faces from cradle to grave and they would never had the impulse the angst uh, to uh, force them into creative work. So you're another... advocating that we should just leave them to their madness because without it, we wouldn't have so many great artistic works littering through history. No, well, well, what I'm saying is pain has a, has a purpose. And, it, <laughs> and, I mean, it's the same with grief. We all suffer terrible tragedies in life. Sure. But we can't sure. throw a blanket of... Uh, of drugs over it to hide it it'll come out in another different way and in primitive societies you know they bang their heads against the wall they scream and shout when they're in deep grief oh. and so should we in you know primitive we've got, societies yeah. that sounded familiar <laughs> yeah we, we've got yeah uh, but it's um you know we we've become too civilized we become embarrassed about uh, grief in life we're too embarrassed about pain we we have to suffer a certain amount because it's the impetus uh, i believe to creative work no i absolutely agree sir and okay. uh, but i would like to thank you for being such a strong advocate of this particular uh plant I want to make sure I understand the link between uh, you don't use it. So this is interesting to me. You don't use it at all, but you are aware enough of its uh, its incredible medical applications, and maybe not even all of them. Maybe you, maybe you just know of a lot of them. <laughs> yes. No. I, I mean, I, I I'm generally opposed to to drugs. I say I've had uh, arthritis all my life. I uh, go around in a wheelchair now. Um, I have difficulty walking, um, but I've never used uh, any drug for uh, arthritis uh, since 1974 when I was offered uh, drugs that would have certainly killed me by now, because I and because I I mean I was trained as a chemist. I'm uh, very well aware of, uh, I mean, there were drugs like Araldin and Oprin that were, were offered to me. I don't think they exist anymore because they found to have uh, very nasty side effects, including death, for God's sake. Well, what do you know so, about uh, CBDs? What do you, does that not help you? Do you, can you take those in? Um, it's not worth it. I, I'm, it, it, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, courageous anyway, but I'm used to living with pain. And oh. I find I, I work better if I'm in pain oh than if goodness. I'm not comfortable. And now this uh, might be masochistic. It sounds yeah, kind of like it is. I still, I still alive. I mean, I'm the only member of my family that's still alive. I, I was a member of a family of sportsmen oh. and one <laughs> sportswoman. And I was the pathetic cripple. I'm now the pathetic uh, geriatric uh, cripple. <laughs> uh, I am still alive. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I, I, yeah, uh, I never. Uh, you know what? I never anticipated that the 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 biggest laugh I got on this show would be from uh, 
from a, a, a politician in England. Uh, that was hilarious. Oh, really, I mean, I'm uh, I'm speaking a foreign language to you. I'm I'm Welsh, you know. I'm, uh, right, right, but you're uh, you're speaking English, you're and and you're in the British Parliament now. What, what was going yeah. on today? There was hardly anybody sitting there. Why is that? Oh, it it varies. It's a it's a very strange place, but uh, you know it. Uh, uh, my bill should have come up at 12.30 today, and there were three statements. The government are in a state of uh, uh, of a deep, uh, nervous collapse, and, uh, you know, they've got a leader that's, uh, that, that's interim, that uh, had a complete nightmare at conference, and they don't want her. Nobody thinks she's going to last very long, but they're frightened to uh, get rid of her because they would turn the party into civil war. Oh. So they're thrashing around trying to find popular policies that uh, might distract them from the, the hell of division in their own party. It's a, it's an extraordinary situation in politics. I mean, I don't know if it was shown in Canada the the terrible uh, uh, speech that Theresa May at conference. I mean, assailed by uh, signs yeah. of wall behind her and her cough and uh, the uh, I mean the fact that someone g- gave her a notice to be sacked in the middle of the speech. I mean, uh, what what an utter screaming nightmare for the leader of a party. But for Theresa May, it's it's pretty much um, she's going to need to be replaced, probably the way things look. And then when, who who it, it doesn't seem to matter who is going to replace uh, her. They're all the same. Well, they, they've got one half of the party wanting brainless Boris, you know, who is uh, an, an extraordinary uh, character, a man who's uh, completely uncontrollable uh, an incontinence of words come flowing out of him and jokes and, uh, and inappropriate uh, uh, comments about everything or they could have a boring uh, economic uh, person that some of the party uh, trusts but w- whatever happens they're going to have a hell of a, of a division and an internal war in the party. But, I mean, it seems extraordinary that uh, Theresa May called an election. She had an absolute majority. Yeah. And managed to lose it. Poor I mean, strategist, I maybe? Yeah. We were, we were 20, 25 points behind in the poll. I was preparing for my uh, retirement because I thought we had absolutely no chance of women winning the election, I, and I doubled my majority. And where does and that so leave you now? For, oh, sorry, I meant to, uh, I, I kind of wanted to hear where you think you're at with the next election. Are you, because of the way things are, and she needs to step down, and how is that going to change things? Is that going to be in your favor? Well, we've got the, the, the hell of Brexit ahead of us, which, which seems crazy. I'm all for tearing down walls, you know, not, not uh, building new walls, which, which we are with Europe. And it's, I mean, I believe there'll be a jobs hell in, uh, if we do come out of Europe because we don't have any guaranteed markets to replace them. But right. it's this little England view that uh, is, is very much against Johnny Foreigner. And they don't like anyone who's not, who's not British. I don't like anyone very much that's not uh, British. They don't like the Welsh very much, I'm afraid. But the, you know, it's a, it's a very much uh, a, uh, a primitive view. It's interesting that the biggest vote against Brexit was in Cambridge, which is uh, inhabited uh, uh, by pondy headed professors who uh, who know how to think. And it's, um, you know, it, it was a terrible decision, I believe, Brexit. And we, we did take a, a, a vote on someone who they, they were going to name a boat and somebody put up the name of Boaty McBoatface. And that won and I think people were in a similar mood when they voted to get out of Europe to escape from Johnny Foreigner, who was the cause of all our ills. <laughs> yes, we saw the Boaty McBoatface scandal. Mm. Yeah, yes. That was an unbelievable situation. Well, listen, you've been so great with your time. I just have a few more questions, if you will. Uh, okay. I wanted to understand what your uh, understanding is on other areas of the world as a, a person positioned in, in your position regarding this and, and getting up in the House of Commons and speaking on behalf of this common sense issue, everybody. Um, I wanted to know where 
uh, other places in the world are that you are either uh, thinking, hey, they're doing a great job of, of transitioning or, hey, they did a great transition or, hey, that's a bad transition. I mean, what, what's uh, your I, take I, on different areas of the, around the globe? Well, uh, I'm very fond of Canada. I had a wonderful uh, holiday there uh, a couple of years ago. And one of my colleagues, a very close friend, we were, we were great pals, and he sadly lost his seat. And he went to Canada and he married a girlfriend. He was 58 and been married and divorced. And he married a girlfriend that he met when he was 18. It was all very romantic. And I went across to Newmarket, uh, near Toronto, of course, uh, to the wedding. And uh, he's, um, he was a great man who joined this No Hope Party, which is now in power, I must say. But it's, I mean, Canada has been the... the uh, the voice of sense in uh, in North America, and uh, I hope we will continue to have a civilizing effect on the people south of you there. Uh, but uh, something we're very proud of, I think, the the links with uh, uh, with Canada. But I, you know, I mean, there are all sorts of strange things happening in China with drugs. They they tended to follow our line. Um, countries like uh, who've been tolerant uh, for centuries if not thousands of years like India and the Far East have coped with uh, with these drugs but we've got ourselves into this idiocy of prohibition and the great uh, message that we should scream from the hilltops is that prohibition makes matters worse it increases drug use and drug deaths and we have to treat uh, drugs in an adult way where adults can make their own judgments on the strengths of the drugs and the enjoyment and pleasure they give them and that we protect the vulnerable uh, particularly those with mental health problems uh, from being abused by this but we also protect uh, those who use these medicines of uh, great antiquity in order to find relief from crippling pain we're not doing that yet in britain I find it interesting that uh, the politicians, such as yourself and uh, so many others, of course, have to craft a way to bring people in on both sides of the aisle regarding issues on a case-by-case -case basis. If I had to describe it, that's that's what I would say. So um, if that's anywhere near close, uh, tell me how it is... I know what you say about Canada being, you know, what cutting edge and ahead of the curve on the United States. And I understand that in a lot of senses. But also some of us are frustrated with um, Canada, Canada's involvement in um, in helping to procure uh, military supply contracts for, you know, Saudi Arabia. While on the one hand, we preach, you know, human civil rights and no bullying. And on the other hand, we are uh, keeping up a, a cycle of jobs, jobs, jobs to prop up um, you supplying a, a, a regime that oppresses human rights with with these machines that we sell them. And at the same time, we're doing that. Um, you know, we're, we're also trying to navigate through a, a, a complicated cannabis schedule. And yeah. so in your experience, I mean, you've got one issue on the one hand and another issue over here. And you, you, you need to form all of these different alliances, right? So what would be your perspective on trying to change the content of a proposed bill that's supposed to be coming into effect uh, in July 2018? But, you know, it's it's before us now as a proposal. It's not actually 100 percent the law at this moment. Uh, this is Trudeau's bill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with all the points you make. There are uh, uh, problems in our relationships with uh, particularly Saudi Arabia now, which is carrying out a, a wicked war in, in Yemen, which is inflicting great suffering on yeah. that country. There are there are. A, there's no real choice between the two uh, opposing sides there. I mean, it's a, it's a dreadful situation, and the uh, we certainly should be pressurizing uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, where they, every Friday they have public executions in the streets where they chop people's heads off. And but we will uh, bow down before them if, as long as they'll buy our jets in the country. But I believe yeah. that uh, Trudeau has come in like a breath of fresh air 
and behaved in uh, a courageous way, uh, more so than anyone else in the English-speaking world. And we, it's been a gradual process in the American states, and th that's beneficial. But, but Trudeau is, um, I believe, uh, something that we look to for uh, inspiration. I mean, he's a, he's a highly intelligent, uh, uh, attractive uh, leader. And uh, the other groups look like, uh, you know, brain dead dwarves compared to his him with his uh, with his stature and his intelligence. Well, I wasn't just looking for a, a little sunshine on my geographic coordinates here in Canada, uh, but is there is there anywhere else in the world where you think, hey, they have it together, or or anywhere I mean, else that you're a little bit alarmed about? I mean, the Scandinavian nations have got it right on social affairs and on distribution of wealth, but they haven't got it right, unfortunately, on drugs. They're still pretty well in the dark ages on drugs there. But they're countries that uh, have a form of socialism that I'd like to uh, uh, sign up to because it's worked very well over a very long period. And uh, they've got societies that uh, distribute their wealth in a way where the bartender... Uh, gets about uh, a third of the wage of a surgeon, and it's um, there isn't the huge differences uh, in uh, in uh, wealth and the wealth distribution that there is in this country. And we've got uh, you know uh, Swedish millionaires come here to avoid paying taxes. And uh, so I think they they are the countries that uh, we could look to with some uh, uh, degree of envy and hope to uh, emulate them. Okay, well. What, what do you see your chances at uh, in the next election? Are you going up? Are you going to be reelected now you've been emboldened <laughs> with this turn? I mean, I know people always ask that question, but, you know, we yes. need to know there's a, a shining light like you involved. I'll just be uh, content if I'm still breathing in, uh, in when I'm 87, which is the time <laughs> the next election. I'll be grateful for that. If uh, my local party say, well, you know, you... Uh, it's better the lunatic we know. You will uh, just carry on, you know, because you you keep winning elections, and that that's a big advantage. And parties like that, that uh, the uh, the voters keep uh, voting me in, and they they they're very nice to me because I've been around forever, and I need. I mean, I knew, I I know most of them by their first name terms. And if I didn't know, don't know them very much, I probably knew their grandparents. So it gets to a stage where you become part of the furniture, and it would be act of treachery if. Uh, uh, to get rid of me. Well, it sounds like you've brought us full circle to the politician. You said at the beginning of the show you didn't like the ones that lied and that you don't. And it no. doesn't sound like you lied to uh, at all today. You, you sound like a very honorable man, and thank you so much for your time, and hopefully we can get some a reaction sometime down the road, a positive okay, reaction right. from your, uh, your, your time in Parliament. Well, thanks for your time too. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, thank you very much. We'll uh, we'll wish you the best, and I'm sure it's been a very long day. So thanks for coming on and telling us all about it. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Okay, take Bye care. Now. Good night. Bye bye. Well, that was and still is MP Paul Flynn. I I have to say that was pretty fun. I like uh, I liked speaking with him. That made a lot of sense to me. He seemed like uh, a guy who is just not going to take his eye off the ball right on up until, I mean, he's with a cane. He needs special assistance getting around. And he makes more sense than so many of the other people. I know people don't necessarily enjoy the uh, socialism aspect, so I'm not trying to win or lose or campaign listeners on that aspect. But, I mean, this guy really does have it right on so many things. He's uh, He's got to be listened to, and especially in the fact that he doesn't even use cannabis, but as an enlightened individual, he sees that it's access. Let's call it medical access. Uh, shall not be medically impeded. And uh, again, I get back to the old recreational and medical are the same thing. Back and forth. Okay.